This episode is proudly brought to you by our major sponsor, Gym Journal. Please use the code MATTER, all capitals, at checkout, and you'll receive a discount on your next purchase. Please find the link in the description. G'day, listeners, and welcome back to another very special episode of the Matter Mentality Podcast, where we talk all things training, nutrition, and psychology to maximize your performance. Got it right this time, so we're going to keep going with that. Today, I'm joined by a very special guest, another American from across the pond. He's uh, going to tell, tell us all things about freedom, oil, and uh, democracy. And we are joined by the one and only CJ. How are we doing, my friend? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me, man. It's exciting stuff. Man, we've been, uh, we've, been, we've been trying to tee this up between my schedule and your schedule. We've been trying to tee this one up for a while. And I think you need to both come to a little bit of a, an end for both of us. We're like, let's just do it. Let's get it done. Yeah, man. Yeah. The, uh, when I'm teaching during the semester, it's really hard. Like I'm gym to university, university to gym, like back, back and forth, back and forth. So to kind of iron out time to get on calls, jump on, do stuff like this is really challenging, but I'm excited to be here. Hopefully I can share some information that's valid for someone and entertaining for someone and or resourceful. I think, um, I think people really don't comprehend just kind of when you start juggling things at a top level, I mean, I don't even want to say that we're uh, near the level that you guys are at yet, where our plan is to have a facility, uh, I would like to say in the near future, but we're learning a lot from the guys like you guys in our group that have the facilities and the programs that you're putting together because it gives us like a, a direction, a blueprint, I hope like that can be done. And the level that goes into still trying to upskill yourself and educate and still run successful programs and still do like, you know, High performers like us, I don't think there's many much downtime. There's a lot of things happening. Like you said, we joked about off air. You know, there's four jobs. You're you're teaching at the university level. You're running a business. You're online coaching, and you're hands-on, deliberate coaching with people in person. It just gets a lot where I struggle. And this isn't the kind of the point of conversation, but I think you know, it's an interesting point to start already. It's a unique situation where I make more friends connecting online with other coaches because they get they get the gist and so when I'm like you know I can't you know respond to you at this time or I can't get back to you or we can't go out for beers on a Friday right away when I'm in like peak uni to like the worst the worst thing for me is uni season and prep season falls to take place so it's either front end of the year back end of the year and it's always around the same time as assignments and and, and uh, exam blocks so it's like, for me, the more invested I get in my clients, the less time I have to be like, hey, let's just go for beers. And yep. I find the average guy that I want to be base with doesn't get it. So it makes it hard. Like, I can have chats with you guys. Like, we can sit here and have this hour chat and we probably want it to be four hours because it's conducive, productive, everyone's learning, we're contributing, giving something back. But like, that time availability where you're like, oh, we can just go down to the pub or, you know, the whatever and have a beer, it doesn't really exist for us. Yeah. Well, you know, a couple things there, right? Number one, it's not crowded at the top. So that's like what I tell my athletes. I literally 10 minutes ago before we jumped on, had a discussion with an athlete uh, about that that exact concept. Like if you want to do what everyone else does, then you're going to get what everyone else gets. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially how that all occurs, right? So for me, it's like I have very clear priorities and things that we're trying to accomplish both as a business and as an individual. Whatever's in alignment with that goal, I'll mm -hmm. do. And everyone around me kind of understands that. And anything outside of those windows, it's going to be significantly harder to get me to agree to. And, mm -hmm. you know, like you said, it's really hard to tell somebody that sometimes, you know, why don't you just be normal? Why don't you just, because yeah. I don't want to be normal, right? Yeah. Like you change. It's like, thank you so much. Yeah. Like that's, Appreciate that was it. the goal. Yeah. yeah. I didn't start out to not change. I didn't start yeah. out to stay exactly the same. Like if I'm going to deliver on the level I want to deliver from a coaching, from a business standpoint, from, from a lecture standpoint, like I need to be dialed and focused on those things. And then the next thing is like to go out for me, I don't know about you, but I'm too old now. Like if I go out, if I have a couple of drinks, like we, we had some drinks at coach catalyst. If I have a couple of drinks, I'm ruined for four days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I can't bounce back. And sometimes I could afford to do the night, but I can't afford yeah. the three yeah. days of brain fog and fatigue that, that follow. So yeah, you know, to you know, it's not crowded at the top. And if you want the same, do the same. 
yeah, I, I had this conversation once with my brother because uh, actually no, it was people. My brother's still very much in a in a you know he, he's got the he's got the partner and that sort of thing. But if he wants to go out on Saturday night, he's going out Saturday night. There's no there's no big deal. There's no big deal Sunday. I still work Sunday. I work seven days a week. I love it. And you know, it's probably not healthy and toxic positive. What the fuck? I don't give a shit. I love it. It's fun. <laughs> it's what we it's what we do. It's what we want to do. Yep. But so so to me, it's like that that the day after starts to impact on what the following day after is the following day after is. So I'm like, I end up on the back pedal because I decided to have a night of, you know, sending it. And you know, the odd, the odd night is not bad. You know, we have, we have uh, very few occasions where that happens, but should I have one? Cool. I have to limit it though. Cause it's not going to be more than that because I know that I've got shit to do or to make time up or to maximize. Like we didn't yep. drink in America. We didn't go do those things because we didn't have the time to be hungover the next day and maximize my time with Cav, maximize my time with you guys, be prepared for my presentation and see the country. There's just there was yep. just no room where all that fits together and have a day hungover. And I was like, yep. that's just that is just how it goes. Like that's just what it's gonna be. But I don't know. It, it gets it gets hard for people to grasp that, I guess, because we don't have the stereotypical white picket fence jobs, right? Like we just yeah, it's not. You're you're act the, the very people that we're accessible to also seem to forget that we're not normal by being accessible to them probably 24 seven. Yeah. Unfortunately, sometimes, right? Like that's, uh, that's something we have to do is like set up those bumpers. Mm. If there's no bumpers. It's all over the place, you know? Um, but that's a systems conversation. <laughs> yeah, like I said, there's 400 conversations here. Yeah, literally. <laughs> let's, let's, let's pivot a little bit. Give us a bit of a background. Cause we're going to, I'll highlight a few things that I think are firstly impressive. I think anyone with a master's or postgraduate degree is impressive, but we're kicking on here for you moving towards your, your, uh, your PhD, which for me, psych is a big deal. Something that I want to get to one day. And it's, I know it's a huge endeavor. We're a six year, we're a six year pathway just for masters to even be called a doctor of clinical psych, let alone yep. a postgraduate postgraduate doctorate. So it's a long haul for us. So I respect anyone that actually endeavors down that path to, continue that education but on top of that and this is where i think most of my respect falls for you is you're doing those things teaching and on top of that then running the very facility that we're here talking about and that that we're going to dive into uh yeah. at ats and then obviously coaching the level of your coaching so yeah there's a lot in there of what you do but the i guess a, a real chance here for you to kind of lay that foundation of where this conversation goes how do we get to that? How do we get to that level of performance? Because I think that resonates with the type of client that you're attracting, right? And they're performing at similar levels because you lead at the top. Yeah, that's actually funny enough. That's one of our core values here is, is lead from the front, right? And it's this concept of like leadership happens through two significant phases. It's number one, what you say, but mm -hmm. it's really easy for people to say things. Oh, yeah. And then it's significantly harder for people to do things. And that's the second level of kind of leadership, right? Lead from the front to us means that. It means we're going to lead by not only our words, right? We're not going to coach with only words. We're going to lead with our actions. Mm -hmm. So that's really important. So to, to kind of tackle this whole thing, you know, I started the whole gym and the concept of the gym with a, a breaking and entering, right? So a, a, a felony in, in some states. Um, so what happened was I came home from my freshman year of college and initially I went to a school in Virginia, actually. And um, a couple of friends of mine asked me to train them. And I said, yeah, no problem. They had seen some of the things I was doing at that time. It was Twitter. Now it's X. I was like posting me working out, essentially. Mm -hmm. I, was I was training my roommate. And uh, they were like, hey, meet us here at this batting cage. I was like, cool. So I'm assuming we have, you know, uh, a, some level of approval to go into this batting cage. Yeah. And get there. Yeah. They're like, they're like, come around the back. We got an entrance. So we're like sneaking through this garage door like thing. We're like, we're like weaving in. I get in there. I'm training these guys. These guys have like a few scattered dumbbells, a couple of weird kettlebells. I remember the kettlebells specifically because we were doing some kettlebell swings and a light turned on in the office, which was like the back front of the building, if that makes sense. And I was like, hey, man, I don't know who that is, but I'm just going to pretend like I'm supposed to be here. Maybe it's a cleaning person. Maybe it's someone else on staff. Like we won't know. So a guy walks out, older guy. He's like, what the hell are you doing here? I was like, oh, hold on just one second, sir. I'm coaching right now. I'm going to get to you in just a second. Turns out that guy, his name is Jim, and he was the owner of the building. He was the owner of the business. <laughs> so <laughs> he, was like, he was like, what the fuck do you mean? Oh, sorry. I don't know if I could curse on here. Oh, but he was like, yeah. okay, cool. He's like, what do you mean? Like, you're, you're coaching. He's like, you're not supposed to be in here. What is going on? So instead of calling the police, Jim was like, listen, you have a job interview with me on Tuesday, XYZ time. 
I show up 30 minutes before the time and I'm pretty sure, and it might change, right? Cause I, I every time I tell the story, I feel like the time gets a little wiggly cause I've been coaching for almost 14 years. Our gym's been open for 13 years. Um, and he said, maybe it was six and I got there at five 30 and he's like, Hey, you were supposed to be here 15 minutes ago. I was like, what? <laughs> he's like, come on out. And there was 12, 13 year old kids just on the floor. And he was like, coach them. So I'm in like a shirt and tie coming for a job interview. I'm like, all right, cool. I pull my tie down. I'm like, let's rock and roll, train the team. The kids loved it. We went through some basic stuff. And uh, the parents were like, we want him. We want him. The guy was like, listen, you're going to train all of our teams. He ran a baseball program. And that's how I kind of got started in, in baseball, um, which is what I'm most known for, for my work and, and performance, yeah. but, um, and also how I started the gym. So, you know, fast forward a few months, I said, Hey, Jim, I'd really like some space of my own. Can I sublet from you? He said, yes. I sublet 550 square foot. We expanded that 13 months. We were full. We couldn't do it anymore. We moved to 2,100 square foot. From 2,100, we moved to 5,000 square foot in three years. Now we've been in this space, which was originally 5,000, but I, I got the third building too. We have three units in a row, which is now 7,500 square foot. So um, over the course of, I don't know, four years or so, it was three and 2,100 square foot. And then we were probably here for two and a half or three before we got the last building. Uh, and now we're opening a second location, which actually won't be by the same name. Um, we're, we tweaked it up a little bit because our target market in the second location is a little different. But um, yeah, that's opening up about 30 minutes from here in September. So we're excited, man. That's uh, that's kind of the long and short of it. On the flip side of that, you know, I've, I've had really great mentors. I've had really great people. I don't mm -hmm. even know if mentor is the right word, but people that have looked out for me mm -hmm. and have had some level of belief in me who are willing to risk a little to get yeah. me to that next level. So Jim in that story is a great example. On the teaching front, you know, I would guest lecture at my college where I got my undergraduate degree. It's called Rowan University. I would guest lecture all the time. I would go in and I would talk to students about believing in themselves, number one. Number <clears> two, <throat> setting a foundation for success with daily habits and rituals. My talk was supposed to be about business, but I don't think I ever really did talk about business. <laughs> it was just- It was like, that brings got back. The fuck's it talking about? Yeah. Well, they loved it. So they kept bringing me back. So oh, finally, <laughs> yeah. So finally, um, the, the guy's name is Dr. Greg Byron. Uh, he's aces. He's actually my boss now. So I kind of have to say that, but no, he's great. And uh, <laughs> one day, uh, you know, I was lecturing and, and after he grabbed me, he said, you would just be such a great teacher. And I said, I'd love to do that. What's that look like? And he's like, well, you need at least a master's degree um, to become an adjunct. And I was like, cool. So I went, applied for a master's degree, rocked it out quick. Then came right back and I said, hey, listen, I'd really love to teach here. And I wound up getting hired um, through the process there. And I've been there for, this is my fifth year. So I've been teaching for five, coaching for 14. Uh, and all because, again, you know, Jim was nice enough to believe in me. Uh, Greg was nice enough to, to not only believe in me, but also expand my own confidence in myself and say, hey, <clears throat> you'd be a great teacher. Mm -hmm. And I think all of that encompasses my approach as a coach. Mm -hmm. I think. A coach, a coach is a few things. Number one, coaching is permission based. So that's it's a really hard concept for a lot of young coaches to grasp to grasp or grab onto. Um, so many times, like we want to like correct exercise or yeah. correct the program or argue about the the stuff, which yeah. by the way, I do love to do. So if anyone wants to argue with me, I'm down. Like we can do <laughs> let's, let's so, like, yeah, yeah, for sure. Like if you want to argue, I'm totally in. But uh, I think more importantly we have to get the permission of the athlete in order to invest in them, invest mm -hmm. our coaching ability and skill. And once we get that permission, I think the biggest thing we can do, sure, we can increase the level of stimulus to then increase the adaptation that we're driving towards. Yes, that's important. But even more important, if you can create a confident environment in, within mm -hmm. the athlete, I think that is is probably the most powerful thing we can do. And if, it, and if it's not, it's 1B to the 1A yeah. of the adaptation, right? So um, and I, I think that's where I kind of developed that over the course of my coaching years is like, if nothing else, if this kid just leaves more confident than he walked in, uh -huh. he's going to be better on the field or in the <clears throat> ring. Right. And it's like, well, that could be enough. Yeah. But, but then, you know, you dig into the science of it, you dig into the X's and O's of actually coaching and developing programs that work and get high level adaptation. And that's nowhere uh, you know, more clear than when you're doing a rehabilitation or a return to play for an athlete. That's when, you know, it really gets nitty gritty. And that's where I'll definitely argue and, and we'll kind of let them hang, so to speak, on on what we do from that side, um, because we do a really good job at that. And that's something I pride myself in. 
but only because we have that foundation yeah. of trying to instill confidence in the athlete and in their own performance. That was a lot of talking. I'm not sure if I answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had Dr. Mark on here. He spoke for literally 15 minutes straight and I could not get a word. And I was like, this is fantastic. Usually I'm the one speaking <laughs> too much. So it's fun. It's great. So to go, to go back a little bit, because baseball is a very niche thing. Like I said, you know, you got the team of 12 year olds and kind of allocated your dad. Did you have a baseball yeah. history? Did you have a baseball pass where you're like, like you play, is it a college sport for you? Is a, I know you guys, you guys, and I've had this chat with a couple of you Americans, the, the pathway for you guys is a little bit different to us. You kind of pick your sport early, either you're a multi-sport athlete or you're just a one sport athlete, but you kind of pick early and it guides you through with the intention to kind of get your scholarship, go to university, try and get a contract. And most of the time, most of the time, from what I've heard, most people really, they look at college as the level, not the professional level, because it's really just like, how do I get this, get my graduate degree from the scholarship and then kind of move into life. Very few look at it and go, I, I actually believe I can go to the NFL, the NBA, the uh, the Major League Baseball. It's just kind of like the pathway is to get to college, get your degree, use college ball or sport to do that and then kind of move on. Whereas in Australia, it's very much like play all of your junior sub-professional levels, your amateur levels, your like... Uh, you know, like you can't reserve grade and things like that and then try and go pro. And that's like, yeah. that is an endeavor. We don't have the college system you guys have where it's like there's money in college system, there's contracts in college systems and let it like a very specific sport and maybe more towards like uh, um, Olympic level, you know, playing and like, get, like getting a contract for like a rowing or, a, you know, something like that where like the college has a particular thing that you do. There's very yeah. little like NRL has a pathway of like, juniors, amateurs, like teens, adolescents, some pro, follow the pro contract. We don't have that sort of pathway besides just basically trying and get a contract itself. So did you, did you have a a pre-start where you're like, baseball's it, I'm fucking in on baseball? Yeah, so I think everybody has at some level, like in America anyway, if you like start to play and you take it serious, you have the thought like, I maybe could do this. Mm -hmm. I could maybe yeah. play professionally. Um, that thought for me was ended very soon on the path, right? Like uh, probably in high school, I knew I would never play professional, but mm -hmm. my goal was to play in college. Mm -hmm. So I wound up playing in college. I played junior college and I played at a division three school. Uh, the junior college I played at was top 10 in the nation. Number seven. Uh, when I was there, I was captain of the team and yep. I was captain of our division three team. We were number one in the nation. Pretty cool stuff. All those things are great. Um, two things on that front. I think number one, like I said, early on, I knew I wouldn't play professionally, but I knew that anything I did, I had kind of this intention of like being the best in class. Right. Mm -hmm. so like when I started playing high school baseball, I was like, I want to play varsity. And my mm -hmm. sophomore year, I made varsity. Right. It's like, we're, we're really, by the way, spinning this yearbook. Holy shit. I'm old uh, back. But it was like, I want to play varsity. My sophomore year, I made varsity. All right, cool. Now I want to be an all Catholic player. My senior year, I was all Catholic, honorable mention. That's it. It's all best I could do. It's okay. Went to, uh, <laughs> went to college. It was like, all right, cool. I want to be the captain of this team. I want to take us to X, Y, or Z, right? So I think I say all that to say, like, I was laying the foundation all along yeah. to this idea of goal, effort to match goal, mm -hmm. and then hopefully achievement. Goal, effort to match goal, achievement, right? So mm -hmm. that that was kind of the process. And that's really what I think playing baseball and being the type of player I was because I wasn't highly skilled, mm -hmm. right? I was much more of a grinder, right? Yeah. I was going to steal a base. I was going to try to stretch a single into a double. I was going to do all those things. I was going to play from a, a team first perspective mm -hmm. and I was going to leave the field, you know, beat up, right? Yeah. Um, and that was kind of like the way I played. And that's also the way that I do business, unfortunately, yeah. to, to some extent, right? Like, uh, and that was something that was really hard for me to put on the back burner, that intention of like, go, go, go all the time, because actually yeah. sometimes business, it's a leadership position where go, go, go doesn't work. You have mm -hmm. to kind of give some leash and let some leash out, um, to those people that are working on your team. So that's neither here nor there, but yeah. So I think. You know, I did play baseball, so I had that background and I spoke the language. That's one of the big keys um, in performance is being able to speak the language. Yeah. Now, it's not to say that you have to play at X, Y, or Z level to be a good coach, because I don't <laughs> believe that. I actually believe the the guys who play at the highest level actually a lot okay. of times make the worst coaches. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's like you you kind of showed up, you know, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. which is awesome, by the way. But 
Uh, not all the time. That's, you know, it's not a hundred percent rule, but I do think that those guys have to work harder on becoming good coaches. And the guys yeah. like me that are a little bit scrappier and had to earn every single chunk of every inning in the game, every, you know, whatever it was, every single hit had to be earned. Uh, I think, you know, we kind of get it from a coaching perspective and we can connect a little bit better to those guys who are going to work hard. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 completely agree around the 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 pathway of coaching from that the, the scrapper level where i think we have to learn more about the sport we have to learn more of the technicalities more of the the basics you have to be optimizing the basics looking the basics better you don't you know that's not to say the great guys aren't doing the basics one of the things i've always learned is that the greats do basics really well but it's like it's yep. a natural instinct to them it just kind of comes like you know the kobe's will drill the same shot 500 times because that you know, they know they need to repeat that exact action of the game. But for yep. the average guy who's like, I don't see where that plays into the game, I need to get better at just understanding it for when I do need it. You, know, you get that basic skill acquisition development where it's like, okay, I understood how I got from A to B and I suck. So if I can get from A to B, maybe I can help someone else get from A to B. And that to yep. me is where that good coaching kind of that that language comes together. And you find that the you know the not so you know one percentile or 99th percentile athlete is the coach. Because they're not, they're selfish. They are selfish people. That's what their their endeavor is yep. to be great at themselves. And very rarely does it transfer over to being great for other people. Unless all of a sudden it clicks in the head and it's like, I'm gonna be the world's best coach. Well, now you've got to change everything about your personality. And that yep. rarely works. But you know, in in from in, in going from that, you know, we're we're at a point now where you've got this like fundamental drive in baseball, and you've got this like this system starting to grow you got like you're the foundation with the company did you always know that you want to take it to professional athletes you want to take it to a fresh professional level did you do you find more fulfillment in coaching sort of like the lower ranks uh, i don't know what like words you guys would use to describe it but do you find you like is the passion more towards building the the lower younger generations up or is it like fuck i've got these lead athletes these already pro level guys that i can tweak one percent and make a big difference where is yep. that like fulfillment come from for you yeah. So right now, currently, I think what I started out, it was much different. When I started out, I wanted to uh, coach the athletes who were like me. I wanted to coach the guys who wanted to make varsity, not the guys yeah. that were like, I'm going to be on the varsity team no matter what. I just have to throw my glove out there. So I think I wanted to coach those guys. Um, now, from a coaching perspective, I think that to get those guys better, the more general the athlete, the more general the stimulus required to create the adaptation and transference that we're looking for. So I think now as a coach and kind of, you know, humbly state it, like I'm really good at coaching. I'm really good at what I do. I'm now that top percent guy. Mm -hmm. um, now I really like, I'm most passionate about fixing problems. Yeah. So I really want high level problems because those challenge my brain the most and mm -hmm. they challenge my ability to coach and communicate the most. So that those are the ones that I like. So what I predominantly do in my business now is only my professional athletes and or return to plays. Those are kind of the only two things that I actually do anymore. Um, here and there, because I love coaching and I'm passionate about it, I'll jump in and like coach a group of high school guys. Or today I coached a, a group of college guys um, that are just home in between before they head off to uh, summer ball. But like the what I do from a day to day perspective is is solve problems. And that's what I like to do. I like to solve high level problems with a lot on the line. I like a lot of of stakes. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of skin in game. So that's for me, like where I'm most passionate right now. And that's probably subject to change, but the, uh, to get that sub elite athlete, as you said, better is to me so easy. Yeah. And, uh, it's very frustrating by the way that everyone can't do that, but that's neither here nor there, <laughs> but like, uh, but to me, that's very easy. So, mm -hmm. uh, or I should probably say simple, not easy, right? Very yeah. simple, but not easy. And, uh, that doesn't anymore like really do it for me. Mm -hmm. um, but what does it is solving high level problems. Give me the guys who have been everywhere and they still can't get a healthy. Give me the guys who that, like you said, that one tweak could make the difference. Mm -hmm. Give me the guys who are out of options. Those are yeah. the guys I'd like to work with now. Yeah. That's just a lot. That's um, yeah. Like it gets fun. You know, physique based coaching is very much, it's not similar in any regard to performance baseball or baseball, but it's, 
it's problem solving and isolating what needs to get attention, what needs to like, what needs to be manipulated, what needs to be changed or tweaked, just just slightly. If I can get you to change the the way you set up a machine, if I can get you to the, I had a client the other day who told me she potentially needed to reprogram because she didn't have uh, the ability on her hack squad. She simply didn't have knee flexion. She's like, oh, it might be a biomechanical issue. I just, I've never been able to do it. I'm like, that's pretty like, that's telling if we can't even get maximum knee flexion on a hack squad. Like the machine itself is systemized to get you to depth. So I'm like, right. It, it does one gym. thing. It's literally its job. That's its job. That's what it's mechanically designed to do. It's like saying a car can't go forward. Like that's pretty fucked if that's the case. So I'm like, all right, let's 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 break this down. Brought her in and you know, got her into got her into the gym uh, that we work out of. And I was like, let's just see how you do some things. Got a lot like I'm I'm think I'm looking for like danger signs first, right? I'm looking for like limitations, structural issues. I'm like, all right, let's set this up. Just simply go about the machine, set it up how you want. And, and get stuck into it. And, you know, I'm looking for issues. There was no issues. I'm like, okay, that's, where's the pain point? And, you know, she was showing me what the pain point was. And I was like, all right, what about we do this? I'm do this. And she made like subtle changes, right? And it was that this particular athlete uh, hadn't been with a coach before that understood kind of how to tweak, like actually coach a client. And it was more yeah. so like they just, they just programmed and off you go like, yeah, we'll check, you know, that's your check-in, here's your program. But there'd never been like a, a guidance through the program or like how to actually move efficiently or effectively. And she was trying to stop mid-range, load the knee, and then drive up from the hack squat under load. And I was like, where do you feel the pain? She's like, in my knee. I was like, well, no shit. Like you're, 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 stopping, <laughs> you're stopping at mid-length of the hack squat at most force and velocity here. And you're trying to just basically come to a dead stop mid-range and then drive out of that position. The quads don't want to do that, and neither does the knee. So it makes sense. You have sore fucking knees. Like, let's just like, make a slight tweak here, right? Let's bring your feet here, like, bring the foot down here, and let's actually tilt the machine slightly, and we'll take the safeties off and go, actually go to range. And I'm like, just go till you feel your bum. Like the, the the machine's designed to stop, right? Like let's just get you to feel the machine safely stop, and you won't hurt yourself. She's like, oh fuck. And the next thing I'm like, okay, so where do we feel that? She's like, in my quads. I was like, what is the hack squat designed to do? In my quads. I was like, okay. okay. Here we you, are. <laughs> this is already this is already someone who was winning shows and had never been able to do a full length, a, a full rep, a proper form of range of motion on a hack squat. And I'm like, you've already been winning, and you haven't been able to do this. Like this one tiny machine, this one tiny change, like that's going to get you now massive stimulus return on doing this exercise where before it's creating pain. Imagine the load we can put in this over time now and get you to adapt and grow. She's like, oh, like it's like this literally this mind-blowing moment i'm like i'm not trying to be addicted to a, to a previous coach but i'm like you weren't getting coached you were getting you were getting prescribed a program but i'm like yeah. this is our job this is the fun shit to me where i'm like give me that one tiny tweak and we can make a, a difference here and now all of a sudden i can train you even harder and other shit because you can just cross that over to something else and go well was i actually squatting properly previously was i doing bulgarians correctly previously was i leg pressing properly correct, uh, previously probably not so now let's implement those changes and see if that works but it's like that tiny thing where it's like, you know, I'm a big believer in most people as coaches just need to simply start and you can correct in general. And like, they just need to put some, some stimulus into the system for there to be an adaptation. And then we can actually get a response from the average person. But like, like you said, you know, those athletes at the top that are already the winning or on the, on the path to winning that tiny change in a program means we can grow the quads better, which means on stage, she looks better. Yep. You actually get real transference, right? And that's like what we talk about in sports performance is creating transfer. And that's a, a topic of hot debate on the internet. And apparently everyone has the answers. No one trains anyone who posts on the internet, which is very interesting, but, um, <laughs> but somehow they have the fucking answers. It's, it's unbelievable. It's, you know, it's crazy to me to think that like you've trained no one, you've trained zero people and you have the answers, but um, everyone does seem to have the answer. And you know, what I've found in kind of like my background and, my coaching has been that again, like we talked about these like very general concepts, right? But everyone's arguing over like the method, the answer. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. And at the end of the day, it, it is conceptual, right? Mm -hmm. I am completely, I, I'm completely agnostic to the method. I'm completely mm -hmm. religious to the result. I want to see that transfer. And we're probably going to have to go if we're working in the weight room or we're working on the track or we're working on the turf, we're probably going to have to go if it's not sprinting, by the way, you know, sprinting mm -hmm. is really easy, easy, not easy to get faster, but easy to see transfer. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if it's throwing, right. And especially with baseball, if it's throwing a five ounce ball at 90 plus miles an hour, that load, the, 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 in terms of total load on the elbow and, or the speed at which the body's moving 
is so fast that we can't replicate that in the weight room with anything we do. So we're probably going to have to go multiple levels down Mm -hmm. in terms of our thought process to increasing the performance of throwing. And same goes for hitting, right? Swinging. We're probably gonna have to go a few levels down to actually get an idea of like what creates true transference. So when we're looking at that, it gets significantly more complex, but the, the very basic understanding of like the more advanced the athlete, the more specific the means. Mm -hmm. That's what it always comes back to, particularly with me. Now, from a return to play standpoint, like the thing that I'm constantly looking at is speed of contraction and or like Sherrington's law of reciprocal inhibition, right? I'm looking for rapid contract relax because at the end of the day, from a muscle standpoint or a neurological muscle standpoint, um, we're looking for high speed stimulus. We're looking for high speed contraction. Then we're looking for high speed relaxation. Mm -hmm. And that's the number one thing that I find gets left out in rehabilitation or return to play programs is that high speed stimulus. And that high speed stimulus can be applied at any level of the rehabilitation. If you know how to apply it effectively for what the athlete can tolerate at that time. So those are like the things, you know, to your point about like tweaking a stance on a, on a, uh, on a hack squat for me, it's installing probably high speed means for a return to throw a return to play athlete. And from a performance side, it's probably installing high-speed means as well that are more transferable. And by that, I mean more biodynamically similar to the actual sporting event. Again, how much transference does that create? We don't know. More. More probably than general at a given point, right? Like at some point, you can't just keep beating your chest and saying like, I'm going to get athletes stronger. It's like the baseball's five ounces, the bat's like two-ish pounds, Like, I don't think particularly that going from like a five to a 600 pound, anything squat deadlift is going to be like helpful. I think going from a three to a five or a 200 to a 500 pound deadlift may be helpful. After that, you're, you're in diminishing return zone big time. The stimulus recovery that it takes to recover from a 500 pound deadlift is entirely too big of a curve, entirely too deep of a curve, I should say. Mm -hmm. to be worthwhile for an athlete it just is um there's so many other ways that we could do that exact stimulus if you really wanted that stimulus without as deep of a recovery curve number one and number two i don't want that stimulus (laughs) right like be specific to the stimulus you're training for or the adaptation you're training for and be specific with the stimulus you apply for it i I don't know those are general concepts to me but apparently again like they get missed a lot i mean even even just consider that like I, again I know I know sweet fa about baseball other than there's four plates and there's guys that hits and there's a guy that throws and that's pretty much the, that's that pretty much just covered the whole sport as far as I'm aware and well don't worry because that's pretty much you got it like <laughs> so there, there's some guys standing out there with gloves and shit too but field and a guy catches it and they're yeah. all admits it's a whole that's that's what I know that's that's the gist of the sport right but yeah like at a certain point like you said you know I I make the same decision when it comes to like uh, so look at something like deadlift it doesn't train what people think it trains and the stimulus to fatigue ratio is too is too weak in my opinion in in the sense of like the return being a a strong investment that majority of a season regardless of where a client is even now as i move towards more performance athletes i would rather than a like a soccer player that i have young fella i want to bring up a powerful posterior chain because i don't want him developing weak knees or weak muscles or ligaments around that area but i don't need him to do a a fucking, you know, learn a 500 pound deadlift. I need to learn, nope. hey, we're not powerful hinging because I want you to have a strong glute and I want you to have strong power generation. But I don't need you to do this in a sense that it's not going to improve your game on the, on the, on the field, on the pitch. So yep. having a, what movement can I do that's going to give that without the, the great degree of stimulus to fatigue? I'm looking at something like an RDL, a variation of a hinge movement where we can load the back properly. And I go, okay, that's actually serving you. And does the rest of your body feel fucked up? No. Okay, fantastic. We can implement that. And at times now where it's like, okay, well, now he's moved into, uh, like you said, similar to yourself, he's he's moved from a, an injury that he had, his sesamoid broke, and he basically couldn't play for like fucking eight or t- 12 weeks. We beat, wow. we beat this, like, the preferred time that they recommend he come back and he's smashing yep. it's great. But at the same time, like, I've got to get power back into your feet. I've got to get you back to like, understanding how to use both feet properly. The load mechanics are going to get better just so we can actually have power of both feet because he runs off both feet. But yep. I'm not going to add a deadlift into the middle of your season and go, oh, I'm going to a really strong power movement because you know I want you to be able to do this really well. Like, yep. 
what does that give you that you need? Nothing. Even my bodybuilders, I don't look at a deadlift and go, everyone's getting a deadlift. It just yeah. like, as a coach, we need to be able to go, okay, what's, as you said, transference here. What does this do or build or give in regard to the outcome we're trying to achieve? But somehow, like people, like you say, they have these kind of methods in their head that, you know, whether they believe there's a one great exercise where everyone has to do a deadlift or everyone has to do this type of squat, like it at that level where people are trying to get a specific outcome or we're trying to get that specific outcome for, for the client, for the athlete, for the individual, there can't be a, this one-stop shop is the answer. It, it simply just doesn't exist that way, right? Like at the level at which you coach people that are so vastly different to bodybuilding, the same concept applies to your guys, it seems to me. Absolutely right. You know, um, at the end of the day, like my students ask me this all the time, they laugh when I tell them the answer. So they always say like, what's your favorite exercise? That's a big thing in exercise science. Like, what's your favorite exercise? I'm like, I fucking hate exercise. I don't have a single one that I like. I can't remember the last time I did an exercise myself that I liked, that I enjoyed. I train, I train every day. I don't like any of it. I, I don't like it. Right? I like, I don't like any, of the, I have zero favorites. I like the adaptation that it, it hmm. that it creates. Yeah. I have no favorite. So for an athlete to come in like, oh, what's the best exercise for a baseball player? What's the best exercise for a fighter, for a boxer? It's like the best exercise for the fighter in front of me, for the athlete in front of me is the exercise that creates the adaptation that I want based on where we are. That's mm -hmm. it. A little bit of a technical hiccup. I thought uh, the American internet just went down and they're about to get invaded. So <laughs> turns out CJ <laughs> just lost his power. So we're good. We're back. Yeah, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> round, I apologize. Round, round two. We're going back for the second half. <clears throat> Let's do the internet it. just can't handle so much good, valuable information in one go. So it's kind of like it just fucked up on it. That's all it was. Yeah, actually, it died from like 26% too, because I was closely monitoring the situation. Um, <laughs> it was down to 26. I'm like, ah, we got 20, 30 minutes left. 26 should be good. You know, 1% per minute should do it. And uh, all of a sudden, boom. All that, all that, all that knowledge and value is just like just bottomed out the power supply. Can't handle it. Yep. We're just cooking too much. Yep. All right, let's uh, let's let's. <laughs> I don't remember where the fuck we were. So this is going to pretty no, much. No, we were talking two <laughs> conversations. Yeah, we were talking adaptation. We're talking stimulus. We're talking transference. We're talking all those things. But I mean, we could shift gears, man. If you got other stuff you want to tackle, I think we talked a little bit about coaching and like how I start it. And next up, yeah. So what I want to actually. <clears throat> I want to move towards uh, uh, something a little bit, well, it's still kind of carrying along the same lines, but I think a bit more uh, in informational from your perspective, given that you are now even teaching, teaching the coaches, you're teaching uh, the future generation of coaches, you're well, hopefully are good coaches and the, the generation of people to come that are going to fill our spots. What is some advice or I guess, what is the advice that you would give yourself going back then that, you see in the difference from, because I don't know, I have a very strong opinion about this, but the the application of what they learn in the textbook and then getting to the field, getting to that that actual trend or even again, transference of knowledge to application. Because to me, there is a big gap. And I've spoken about this with several very well educated coaches that do have that, you know, we end up with that Dunning Kruger of like, oh, I've done my undergrad and now I'm going to go teach Usain Bolt how to add an extra two seconds off his fucking sprint time. And you're like, shut the fuck up. But I read this textbook that this is how the mechanical load should work and this is how like speed mechanics should work. You're like, cool, but if someone else hasn't thought of that yet, chances are you haven't. So given that you know, you're now in that, you're in the educational space, but you're also a coach and you also work with such a vast array of athletes, how does someone like you give advice to, well, it would need to be a previous version of you or in the hands of the actual students that you're working with to be that better coach and not fall into that trap? What, do you, what, what advice do you give there that you went through? Yeah. So I think it's three things, right? So number one is like nothing uh, can come in place of actual hours in coaching, right? We talk about like being in the trenches. That is going to be the number one educator of the coach, right? You don't know what you don't know until mm -hmm. you're actually in there working with the athlete. And the athlete looks back at you and says, I don't understand what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And, or you take the athlete through the program, the perfect program that you wrote and you get no feedback from it. <laughs> you mm -hmm. get no improvement. In which case is like, now I have to go back to the drawing board and I'm forced to kind of refocus my effort and energy on actually creating a result for this person. So number one, have to get into the trenches, right? Mm -hmm. Number two, the second idea is like this concept of um, 
mimicking, right? Or mimicry. And one of the things I talk to my athletes about as well, and you know, my students is this idea of when we go and look at someone, right? And a lot of times this is a based around social media. So I'm trying to make it a more general perspective, but a mm-hmm. lot of times I'm talking about social media and it's like, you're comparing yourself, which is really the thief of all joy, right? Comparison thief of all joy in that when you try to compare and or mimic someone else, you're essentially robbing your own wealth. You're robbing your own being of what could be something brand new, something brand uh, or something very unique, something very worthwhile and valuable because you're so caught up in the comparison and or the mimicry of mm-hmm. the other person that you've seen. So we have to be really careful w- with that construct and, and comparing ourselves, our coaching style, our coaching journey, who we're working with, our business acumen, our business kind of level, for lack mm-hmm. of better terms. I think that's really, really important. And you get to these points where it's like, in the beginning, as a student, you know that you don't know. Mm-hmm. Then you work up to this level of like, you know some things and you know what you know. When you get to that level of you know what you know, what you actually know is significantly less than what you believe you know. Uh-huh. And having and, and having that realization to say like, I think I know some things, but there's a vast yeah. hole, right? There's like almost an abyss yeah. between the things that I know and the things that could create and apply to an athlete to create Mm -hmm. the actual adaptation that you're looking for. So understanding and having that awareness is really important. That's something I tell my students as well. And then finally, you know, kind of the last thing about this, and this is something I talk about all the time um, to my students. It's actually the the talk I give on the last day of class. I talk about uh, Pythagoras Mm -hmm. and this concept of the fifth hammer. I'm not sure if you've heard this before. So interesting. um, Yep. So Pythagoras is obviously well known for his mathematical equations as a thought leader, Mm -hmm. Um, Pythagorean theorem, all those things, A squared plus B squared, C squared, right? Uh, But listen, don't ask Terrence Howard about that because apparently none of that shit's right, Uh, but neither here nor there. So uh, as a thought leader, right, Pythagoras is struggling one day with this concept, this formula that he's working on. And he walks to kind of get some air and he walks past the blacksmith shop and he hears five hammers clanging against the metal and the five hammers clanging kind of create a sound. And that sound is almost romantic in a sense, right? It's very mm-hmm. much rhythmic and, and it has its own beauty to it. So you could call it a song. Uh, Pythagoras is like, I have to know why these five hammers create this song. So he buys the hammers from the guys, he takes them back and he studies them through this idea, his, his own perspective of mathematics, And he finds that the first four hammers line up perfectly mathematically within a quarter of whatever, say an inch, quarter of an inch of of each other. And he says, well, you know, he kind of postulates. He says, these four hammers create a song because they're within one quarter of an inch of each other's in size. So when they're clanged in succession, they create that song-like melody. The problem is that the fifth hammer has no mathematical significance to the other four. It is essentially an outlier. Mm -hmm. But, But the truth of the matter is, you can't have the song without the outlier, Mm -hmm. right? So the four hammers in and of themselves have and hold no power, no relevance without that fifth hammer. So one of the things I tell my students is go ahead and be the fifth hammer. Be okay with that. Mm -hmm. Be okay with with being the outlier, the outlaw, the person who's not afraid to challenge the status quo and go outside the bumpers a little bit because ultimately everybody else is taken. So you have to be 100% you, you know? And uh, that those are the kind of the three constructs I tell them in terms of creating application. Number one, understand that you know what you know, but you don't know what you don't know, mm-hmm. right? Number two, be the fifth hammer. And I'm out of order here, but be the fifth hammer, right? And then number three, get some time in the trenches. Yeah. Actually go and coach athletes. And when you start, yeah. you're going to suck. The first time you did everything, you sucked. Yeah. Be okay with that. Yeah. It, 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 it gets exciting to me when i see philosophy cro- uh, co- <clears throat> cross over into coaching so much not even just in like <laughs> nerds, dude i don't know we, we fucking are it's it's fantastic <laughs> but it means other people get better so why not yep but just not even in the sense of like you know having beautiful stories like you know you throw it back to pythagoras you know, we go back to socrates you go back to the stoics the early stoics we can go back to the early antiquity and look at greek philosophy and all that sort of stuff it's cool but even in the sense of understanding like uh, peterson talks about just the archetype of concepts and constructs that people need to consider. People talk about heavily being the master, right? And like you literally just touched on it. It's one of my favorite concepts Peterson talks about. 
everyone wants to be the master, everyone wants to be the elite athlete, the high performance athlete, the the business guru, the the you know seven figure business guy. You know, I want to do this in my career. I want to be elite lawyer, whatever it is you want to be. But absolutely no one, and there's a reason why one percent do things. No one wants to be the fool before they become the master. But in the equation, if you didn't map it out, you, you apply some mathematics to 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 philosophy. Before you become a, become a master of something great, you have to first be the fool of something and suck. And it's yep. like so many people want to go. They think, you know, this age of this age of entitlement, X degree equals greatness. Therefore, I don't have to put any work, and I should just go straight line from you know graduation to instant high paying job. The reality is, all that degree is giving you now is an entry level ticket to start to actually learn. You've learned yep. that you have an entry ticket. Now you actually get to learn, and it's like. The amount of people that can't wrestle with that or can't grasp that concept, but in something like coaching, in something so objective and subjective at the same time, there is such a, one of the things I try to teach in one of the courses that we're going to put out soon is this, this concept of the hard and soft skills in coaching. And it is directed more towards physique and, and, and the performance of physique coaching and body yep. development, but the application transfers to multiple sports or endeavors because the concept is you can have the hard skill knowledge. You know, the hardware can be there, which is great. Your knowledge on technical skill acquisition, skill development, you know, mechanical tension, the principles of hypertrophy, body composition, nutrition coaching, all that sort of shit. Fantastic. But what if your client doesn't do it? Well, according to your textbook, this should have worked. Well, guess what? Now that you start to realize the textbook doesn't have the data on every single person that's ever existed. We have generalities, and those generalities were taken maybe 10, 20 years ago by the time I actually got the data constructed the cohort studies it's now in a meta-analysis and now it's in the textbook that 10-year difference now people changed trends have changed things have changed people the way we understand things have changed so you have this textbook knowledge that's great you're starting to realize now that not every single person abides by every program they're given and you need to start figuring out why and you need to start thinking critically and assessing is this a them thing or is it a me thing well how do i make their thing a me thing and solve the problem that to me is like where you start to get philosophy mixed into coaching and go, oh, I went in there guns blazing with these guys being like, I'm going to solve your $7 billion problem in this company or like, oh, you're, you know, the New York Yankees, you got this fucking, you know, amazing program and you guys are sucking and you got like, I'm going to solve this and make your baseball, uh, your, your batter even better. And then what happens when it doesn't? Or all of a sudden this batter is actually, you know, too egotistical and arrogant because he believes he's great or he's playing at the NBA, at NBA level, so he should, probably is. And you're telling him that you can add 5% to his swing? That's a big difference to someone who really thinks they're great. Now you have this concept, right, where you have to admit that you have no fucking idea how to coach people because you've read the textbook. You've done the textbook work. You've done the 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 endeavor of text knowledge, but you have zero application. And now all of a sudden you start to realize, oh, this gap here, that's coaching. That's where I'm actually in now. And all that work that I was talking about bragging on social media and putting up my theorems and my beliefs and hypothesis about how this program should work and this person doesn't understand movement mechanics and then you got a guy like yourself where you're in the trenches saying hey actually shut the fuck up you have to get in here first and figure it out before you start batting your mouth off and talking shit basically yeah yeah i think it's it's both art and science right and that's mm -hmm. what we come back to all the time you know there's an art to this thing mm -hmm. uh, we are in some ways painting right yeah. it's in some ways painting a picture for an individual with the individual right and, uh, you know, just funny aside, like we grade our coaches on 10 uh, core kind of constitutes, right? Key performance areas. Mm -hmm. Only one of them, only one of the 10 is knowledge on training. <laughs> That's it. Good. You know, there's literally nine other things that I care about as it, much right? or more. What's that? You can teach knowledge on training. It's, exactly. It's, I can make you. I can make you less stupid. Hundred percent. Exactly. I can make you less stupid. I can move yep. the dial two points or two degrees of separation. But this, yep. I find the soft skills and teaching someone to understand a person and people and performance and, and getting that out of a client, like the calves, the use, even myself, the ability to get something out of a person doesn't necessarily require a textbook knowledge. It's a specific, it's a, it's a, it's a trait. It's an undefinable skill, but it is a skill. Like it's definable, it's not, but it's not. The ability yep. to draw that thing out of that person and make them want to be better for themselves, even if they don't see it, or we see it, they see it, and now it's like actually extracting it goes beyond X's and O's of what, uh, you know, exercise mechanics tells us about force and leverage and, and and levering. There's just something different to it than just simply, oh, there's, it's in a textbook here, therefore you should do it. It's, it's, yep. it's actually something that needs to spend time being learned or understood as a coach, but we spend so much time teaching X's and O's 
and then being like, okay, now go deal with, you know, athletes or clients or lifestyle yeah. populations, whatever. And to me, it's just like, there's so, it's such a, like, like you said, it's an art and a science and a philosophy all at once. Yeah. It's, um, it's funny too, because we try to systematize things, right? And like, mm -hmm. we have to, we have to create systems in order for businesses to function appropriately. Mm -hmm. One of the systems that we have to create is an operation system, right? Where we're delivering training. So you try to systematize that, but there's no way, there's like no one way, you know, to deliver a message. There's no one way, even if I write the training and I give the training to you and I have it and whoever, coach three has it and we all take an athlete through it, it still is different, mm -hmm. right? So people ask me all the time, they're like, you post so many things on Instagram, aren't you worried? Like, aren't you worried somebody's going to take it and do it? I'm like, no, absolutely not, please. Be best of luck, number one. But number two, if it's helpful, then absolutely use it, you know, maybe you get something out of it. But I think more so than that, it's, it's cook, not recipe, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's, mm -hmm. it's the person actually managing the thing. So it's, it's one of those things where even with a system in place, a system is just that it's bumpers. Like we keep going back to this concept when you're bowling. And I only go back to that because I suck at bowling. I'm not, I'm not afraid. <laughs> no shame you know, in my game. Like kid tracks that you just roll the ball down. <laughs> Hell yeah, dude. And listen, if there's a nine-year-old playing against me, I'm going to smoke his ass too. I'm not playing, dude. I'm, I'm like, I'm here to win, man. Forget it. Yeah. <laughs> Forget that, dude. I'm winning with the bumpers. But so, so this concept of bumpers, like the, the system is just that. It's just bumpers. It's to make yeah. sure we don't go off the rails. Straight right. Up. Yeah, exactly. But my coach is going to use somewhat different words. My coach yeah. is going to use somewhat different tactics to deliver mm -hmm. That, and we even have that, you know, systematized within our business. Like we have the actual cues we use systematized, but nobody gets in trouble for yeah. when outside of that system. It's like, mm -hmm. hey, you know, we usually say whatever we say, say it's, you know, a deadlift. We usually say soft knees, hinge back, drop straight mm -hmm. down to the bar. It's like that's in our manual, right? But if you say soft knees, push your ass back mm -hmm. because you know that you're working with this person, they, that, you know, rings more true with them. That's great. I don't care. Mm -hmm. As long as the deadlift looks great and looks perfect and we're driving mm -hmm. towards what we're trying to accomplish. But at the end of the day, like frameworks are important, but the hard skill, or as you said, the soft skills of coaching, I only call it the hard skills because that's what we name it in our framework. Our hard skills are soft skills, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Connection. You yeah. know, so that stuff you can't learn from a textbook. You have to spend the time in the trenches doing it. And there has to be some realization about kind of where you are and where you're trying to go. Yeah, I think too, one of the one of the neat little additions there to kind of wrap up that point is nowadays that everyone has access to social media and your guys that have two years of experience have 200,000 followers, there's this concept of like almost bypassing the buying point. Like you need to bypass the 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 shit and the time in the trenches. You need to bypass the you have got to work to to understand these things. I just simply know more because I read a textbook and I can tell it in a fancy way. Or a, or a neat way that draws attention when really we just know that sex sells and polarizing things are attention grabbing. That's all it really is. Yeah. But the average, the average, the good coach out there just putting it, putting in the work and putting out the content that's actually useful and informative isn't trying to do it to garner followers. They're doing it because they want to help. But we get those coaches that you know, the social media game has made it easier to perceive the idea that you can bypass the shit. And then all of a sudden you're an expert in something you have no business claiming expertise in. And I think that's where we start to get really murky waters in coaching, which is like, uh, I get one of my uh, clients actually starting up. He's a PhD uh, candidate for, um, or, or researcher, sorry, for the actual school that I go to um, in exercise science. And we joke about it all the time in how, how misunderstanding even students nowadays are of what the science tells them or what the research tells them, what is actually applicable to their clients. Like, you know, it gets so heavily evidence-based where people think they're coming up with like, you know, they're in you know, the most minute detail how to in, in hypertrophy when they're recently talking about the, the five degree difference in the leg, the setup of the leg extension to increase the statistical growth of the rec fan. Right. And yep. we're getting to this point now where it's like over complicating, over exaggerating this evidence of research and programming. And you've got people that are working with gen pop clients and the majority of like, you know, you might argue this is useful to a, a uh, tier one level Olympia bodybuilder because they need to grow some rec fam. I agree. Cool. Let's figure that out. That's that's our problem solving ability. 
But when you've got coaches that are following you that are, are working with gen pop up to amateur level, first time competitors or like first time, first year trainers, and yep. you're starting to hear people talk about like how to isolate the rec fam and quality. Mate, the, the fact is that you've, you've bypassed the thought that when you actually get into the training with those clients, they don't need it. They're going to get an adaptation just simply by doing leg extension, not whether or not there's a five degree angle difference in the chair. But we've got to this point where it seems like the, the information era is almost creating a crux to coaching. So you can just technically bypass the skill of learning how to work with people by just throwing more evidence at it. But that's not how the evidence works. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's kind of interesting too in in that understanding, right? Is like you and I probably need to know that. You yeah. and I probably need to know how to set up the leg extension machine the best. Probably not me, but you, right? Probably need to know that. I probably need to know, you know, depth drop versus weighted depth drop and the the latest research on that, right? Mm-hmm. Or the latest research on kinematic sequencing for throwing for rotation. I probably need to know how the most elite throwers in the world sequence effectively. I probably need to know how the most elite strikers in the world sequence effectively so I can reverse engineer some of those things. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of the people out there, probably even listening to this, it's cool if you know that, but make sure you don't try to apply that to the person who's not there, right? And again, like even if you did and you would make the argument because the other argument would be like, hey, if that's the best way, let's do the most optimal way now. I would argue that that's probably overkill, right? You're probably kill you're probably killing a fly with a shotgun at that point, number 1. And number 2, when you utilize the most advanced means too early, you lose the effective ability to flip yeah. over an ace card later. Yeah. Right? Maximize the most general means towards your goal before you go for the most specific means. Once you utilize those specific means, you can always get an adaptation, but you'll never get that adaptation the same way you did the first time you flipped it over. The first time that novel stimulus was introduced will give you probably the biggest jump. Yeah. Right. And and we talk about that even from a PED perspective. If people are going to use PEDs for their sport, Mm -hmm. I'm I'm neither for nor against PEDs. Like that's a context dependent situation. And I don't give athletes PEDs or anything like that. But the conversation around that has to change a little bit in mm-hmm. the understanding that, and I talk about this on a, a couple of content pieces, like athletes in high school should not be even thinking about PDs. Right. They should be thinking about food. Yeah. Like, food like none like, of you eat. Yeah. <laughs> like, like none of you eat and you're all on TikTok till 2 a.m. And like, yeah. I'm answering questions about PED usage. It's like, no, no, no. Yeah, Maximize yeah. the most rudiment means first. Yeah. Then if you want to yeah. talk later about that discussion, once all those things have truly maximized, where you have nothing left to gain from normal eating in a caloric surplus, from normal nine hours of sleep a night for a high mm-hmm. school athlete, to, from normal strength training, where you're maximizing just literally the ability to produce force, rate coding and summation at a high level. Until you maximize that, then let's not go to the next thing. Yeah. But it is helpful if you know the next thing. So from a coaching perspective, if I'm a coach listening to this and I and I have any kind of amount of respect for myself or you, it's like, learn all the things, but make sure you don't go into the training space, into the trenches and kill flies with shotguns. That's probably not necessary. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, at that point, you, 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 I find too, and I don't know if you found this, but if you try to overcomplicate and advance too quickly, you run the risk of driving the client away because they don't feel either adept to what with it, that they think they should be doing, or you put this almost like fear of not being ready in their head. And it's like, they go, well, if this is how this guy coaches, I'm not ready for that. And therefore it's like too overwhelming. I'm going to take a step back. And now you're yeah. driven away from the interest of getting more coaching and development, which could be a long-term client or related client, or just acquisition of getting results. Instead of going, meeting the client where they are, you want to kind of ego flex your brain and go, well, I know all these cool biomechanic techniques and tricks to, to maximize. Cool. This dude doesn't even know how to, you know, do a, a lengthened position of a, of a, of a, a leg press properly yet. They kind of get great at knee flexion. And they're lifting yeah. the hips off the seat and you're worrying about, can I get this extra one percentile out of their, you know, their contraction to try and maximize some minor isolated part of the quad. They don't even have yeah. quads yet because they don't know how to train. So let's like get them some quads first. Then we'll talk about the other stuff. I think that's just a you know, concept there, but that it kind of leads to my next question is, is inside that sport. I think like, you know, this kind of will, I think you've already kind of answered it, but it, it's going to give a good more specific context the thing going from like, you know, we talked about like textbook knowledge, we talked about that, but now you're at the 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 academic level of teaching. And again, 
great success in business. You've got elite athletes. You've got amateur athletes. You've got a system in play. What would you give as advice to? What would you teach to people in regards to the business acumen side of our game? Because I think it's a big concept that isn't taught well. Like you said, there is, there's parts of your PhD now that you're doing that is around like leadership communication, business communication, which is awesome. Uh, but I think uh, you're, you're like, that's a PhD level, right? How many people are going to go into a PhD after they get their, ex, their, their undergrad, maybe a postgrad honors or something like that? There's a large gap between the, the textbook of coaching someone and then business. But we all go, it's kind of like, you know, in Australia, it's quite common to go from finishing your trade degree or finishing your trade craft, your, your, your apprenticeship, to starting a, a trade business. And there's, there's that gap between where it's like, it sounds cool in theory, but do you like numbers? Do you like staying up late? Do you like admin? Do you like accounting? Do you like the marketing, client acquisition, funnels, lead systems, client retention models, you know, systemization of your facility, mapping out equipment that you want? Like there's something in there to teach that I think the upcoming coach can learn from outside of bodybuilding coaches. Cause I'm going to tell most people to just fucking simplify shit, but yep. for yourself, it's a unique avenue of coaching that I, I would love to be, or that I'm curious on, that you would probably teach. Again, it's probably not in your lecture that you're teaching, but on advice to those very students on the business side, what are you saying to them to go, look, you know, you're starting out. It's not all bells and whistles and it's not all fancy shit. There's going to be a lot of suck in here on the business side. Yeah. So a few things on that. Number one, um, so I teach one course called Lab Personal Training, which we're actually phasing out for a, a new course. But in that course, we actually had two lectures on business, but that was it. That's all you would get. And it was if I taught it, right? So in your four years, you would get two lectures on business. Um, what we're trying to do and actually what I'm working on is um, designing a full course, a three, a three credit course and getting it accredited called the business of fitness. Mm -hmm. um, fingers crossed, I get that done. And uh, the university's on board with it and, and we get it uh, accredited and, and into the actual curriculum because I think that could really help so mm -hmm. that's number one. Like, that's kind of like, you know, the big goal for that, which I'd like to get done. Um, the course like syllabus is written. So once that gets approved, then we go to the next level, we get the textbook approved and then, like so on and so forth. So we're going to work through that. So I'd like to do that. But I think, you know, the business conversation that I'm having is first identifying where you're trying to go, because that was my biggest mistake. And that actually slowed me down a ton in business was this idea of like, where do you want to go? Cause you battle the ego of being the person being mm -hmm. the coach. And then when you move into a more owner driven role, you are no longer the coach, or at least you shouldn't be because mm -hmm. if you are, then you're not building the business. You're just mm -hmm. coaching. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and there's a blend, right? Like I still coach, but I only coach when I want to. And I only coach yeah. about five hours a week, yeah. you know? Um, if I wanted to, I don't have to coach. And that's important. You have to build to a point where you can do that and I can go. And like I said, I'm starting a second gym. You know, I can do that because I have the time and the resources to invest in that. Right. So that's number one is like identify where it is that you want to go. Do you want to be a solo practitioner forever? That's okay. But understand all the things that come with that. If you're training people in person and you're the solo practitioner, you're not going to be able to take a vacation, at least not a very long one, you know, a couple of days, mm -hmm. maybe an extended weekend. You push people here, push people there, right? Number one. Number two, you're always going to be kind of at the mercy, so to speak, of the hours of training, which the mm -hmm. hours of training are when other people aren't working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Or in school, right? So you're going to have a, a non-contemporary schedule always, mm -hmm. right? Which again is okay. Uh, these are all the things that you need to think about and consider though, if you're going to stay solo. Um, or do you want to create opportunity for people like me? Like I want to create a lot of opportunity for great coaches, number one, but number two, the, and the bigger concept for me is impact, right? I want to create a bigger impact. And that's, it took me probably seven, eight years to flip the switch where it was like, Hey, I don't want to just create the impact with the 150 people that I can train by myself. I'd like to create a bigger impact. So now our, like our, one of our big missions in, in this location is to have 300 people at all times, right? And be mm -hmm. impacting 300 families in South Jersey. You see the, the best gym in South Jersey behind me. Our mission here is to create 300 impacts every single month. And then in our new location, we want to have another 150 families that we're impacting. When you look at it from an impact perspective and you get very clear on that, then you can then reverse engineer all the things 
the mm-hmm. marketing required, the staffing required, the systematizing, yeah. the operation delivery systematizing, the financial end of that of this thing where you can get yourself to a point to do that. But if you don't have that clarity, if you lack that clarity, then you're going to always be kind of spinning the wheels, Yeah, right? You're going to move in and out of this ego-driven idea. Of you let somebody coach a couple sessions, an athlete likes them better than you. Yeah, well, get out of here, right? Like I'm gonna yeah, jump yeah. back in and try yeah. to be the guy again. You have to move past that, or don't. But be clear on it, right? Like yeah. if you want to be the guy or the girl, then that's what you're gonna be, and it's gonna be really hard um, long term. Our industry has one of the highest burnout rates of any industry, and it also has one of the lowest paying median uh, salaries. So it's like you're gonna get paid not a whole lot, and you're gonna have a shitty schedule essentially and the risk of burnout's pretty high. So I uh, my my advice would be to get clear on what it is and then again once you're clear on that try to build that as realistically as possible where you could still have the lifestyle that you want too. If you are going to be a solopreneur forever, then only train people at x y and z times and be very clear on those days that you're not there. Mm-hmm. And don't bend those rules for anybody, right? Don't break those rules. Um, because eventually you will. And then when you do, it's a whole thing, right? So I guess that my very first thing is, is be very clear on what you're trying to accomplish. Number one, number two, understand that business from a mechanic standpoint is simple, but not easy, right? Mm -hmm. It's generate leads. Once you generate leads, it's get them in the door, Mm -hmm. get them in the door. Once you get them in the door, you sell them your product, right? You identify where they're missing the boat and you, really clearly ident- once you've clearly identified that you clearly uh, state how you fill that void or what they're missing mm-hmm. right now you sell them the service then you deliver the service you retain the clients long term and then you make sure that you know you have a system in place to handle the financial end of things all of that is simple but not easy mm-hmm. and it requires not only time in the trenches like we discussed before from a coaching skill perspective, but it also requires probably some help and assistance, right? You're mm-hmm. probably going to need to get really good mentors or read a whole lot of books, which I've done both, and and get really, really good at doing some of the stuff you don't like to do even before you ship it out. Because I think a, another kind of caveat to like business is you start shipping stuff out that you don't want to do and you don't really know how it should be done. Yeah. And that and that creates some kind of uh, gray area there too. Whereas like, is that really being optimized or maximized at the highest level it could be? So um, simple, but not easy. Be very clear on where you're trying to go. And I don't want to ramble on too, too long, but th- those are kind of like my big pieces of business advice, my big rocks. And then from there, we can create the systems to do all the things, right? Mm-hmm. But only if we know where we're going and we understand that this is not going to be an easy journey. Yeah, I like that. And then very, very clear, very simple. Like it is, it is an overall simple, like it's a simple process, but like you said, it's not an easy process. Like one, right. you, you start to realize too, that once you're, once you're, once you're doing the things too, even if you get really good at them, there is also the the requirement of repetition. You simply just have to rinse and repeat. You can't really get to a point where it's like one and done when you have a service based uh, a client portfolio, where, you know, it's like a builder, a builder is not going to get retention models. A builder is going to get with a, a developer who's like, hey, we have 2,000 properties over the next 10 years. Cool. Give me 10% of those. I'm not making bank. That yep. that that builder is pretty good unless that that contract goes under. For us, it's like someone can drop you at the drop of a hat and you're like, now I've got to fill this book again. I've got to fill this this, this gap or this client, uh, my roster. And that can happen like that. And you can lose, you know, two $3,000 worth of clients in a week. And it's like, well, shit, what the fuck just happened? And it just, it just happens. Things like, you know, the big C happened and we got a lockdowns and there's pandemics and limitations, financial like uh, declines. And I think that's where people, you know, they get, even if they get really good, like, again, the ego comes where I just, I don't want to do that anymore. Okay. That's fantastic. But, you know, you look at you, you look at me, we're still behind the camera recording content because there's a way we want to say things that resonate with the people we're bringing in and people want to associate, like, we're not, you don't want to just purely be the face of the brand entirely, but you want to be part of the brand where people go, that's the kind of person we work with. If they have someone like him, I'm in. And that's yep. where it's like, that's where us putting behind the content, getting the content out there, solving the problems, putting that information, we're probably going to do that for a long time. If Alex Mosey is still recording content, chances are we're probably still going to have to record content. And that's yep. the thing, like, you know, people get so scared of, you know, there's the, the, the big problem in our industry is 
people that are unjustifiably cocky are willing to speak and the people who should be speaking aren't cocky enough to speak. And then you end up with this incongruence or this gap between where it's like the wrong information is getting out there and clients are going to the unconfident, uh, the, the unjustifiably confident that, can't, that aren't even really backing it up. They can speak really well. And then there's guys like, you know, I hated speaking in front of the camera when I started. Guys that actually have the right thing to say or that can get you the result aren't speaking enough because we're not in, we're not doing it to be in front of the camera. And it's like, well, but you can't get those leads into your door unless you're doing it. And it's like that stuff there, that hard stuff that you don't want to do that it may just be in your best interest to learn to do it so that eventually you can systemize it, outsource it, maybe get someone else to speak for you. But at the start, you need to fucking do it. Yeah, I mean, on that front, like number one, when I started putting out content, like the reason I didn't before that was I was too busy actually coaching. Weird, <laughs> like weird concept, you know, That's like I was yeah, crazy. Yeah, I was coaching, you know, and then I started doing my own content and I did over whatever, thousand videos. And now we have, I mean, I have at least 900 videos that are all professionally created. And we actually just recently structured them all according to like time of the year and, and all those mm -hmm. things. So theoretically, I could stop creating content today and have three years worth of content that we could reutilize, kind of repurpose, just put new hooks on and go. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do that, but that's in theory, like I could do that. And you see my gym page now, what, what the gym does is from an athlete perspective, they utilize some of my content, but most of our athlete content for the gym is driven through the athletes that are actually in the door. We like to highlight them, make them stars, right? Yeah. But you did mention one thing and, and I wanted to just touch on it, the retention idea, right? And the retention idea is so important in our space, in our industry. And one of the, the kind of the global concepts around retention is this idea of why people come and why people stay, right? So people come to you for a result. Mm -hmm. Right, they're looking for a thing. They want they want you to fill a void that they can't fill by themselves. But people stay for the experience. Yes, right. And that's what the number one thing I tell my students all the time, and I tell our coaches is like, people come for the result, but they stay for the experience. So how do you create now an experience around the coaching environment that is bigger than just the result? Mm -hmm. Now, of course, you have to get results, but yeah. that should be the minimum. And like we already discussed, like uh, from a very at a, at a low level, like you just have to apply some stimulus. Yeah. It, can, it, it almost doesn't matter what it, yeah, it almost doesn't matter what it is. Like they're yeah. going to get a result, but it's in like, how do I enroll them in the process? A and B create an experience that, mm -hmm. and we have, so we have two things in our onboarding that I really like. We call them uh, lockdown moments or car ride moments, right? So car mm -hmm. ride moments for our athletes is when they get in the car with mom or dad, mm -hmm. mom or dad is unequivocally going to ask, how was your workout? Right. It, it only mm -hmm. makes sense. If a kid, if an athlete gets in the car and says, it was good, we have lost. We are yeah. on the path to losing that kid. He mm -hmm. won't be at our gym for long or she won't be at our gym for long. And they say, why? They said, it's good. You know, it's like, no, because good is not an experience. Good is checking a box. We want to fill a bucket. Yeah. Right? yeah. So we, we have to create the opportunity and we call them lockdown moments. We have to create the opportunity for a lockdown moment. Something that goes and transcends the actual training, the X's and O's of training, and creates an experience for the athlete. So mm -hmm. maybe it's okay. highlighting an athlete doing something that they've never done before. You know, a per, uh, PR, I think you guys call them PBs down there. <laughs> a PR, right? <laughs> you um, got fox. Yeah, I don't know what the hell you guys are talking about. But uh, a PR or a PB, you know. Uh, or, or it's highlighting an athlete's consistency. Or it's highlighting an athlete's social construct or, or social um, kind of awareness and or um, like lack of shyness, for lack of better terms, right? Like, mm -hmm. hey, like when you came here, confidence, that's what I probably should say, social confidence, right? When you came here, you couldn't even talk to us. Now you look us in the eye, you shake our hands, all those things, right? Mm -hmm. Like these are huge milestones that transcend training, the X's and O's, but are a part of the process yes. that we can highlight lockdown. And then all of a sudden now we've created a car ride moment or for our adults, a lockdown moment where they go, wow, you know, I really like going to ATS. I really like matter. I work, like working with those guys and people say why, and they don't. The first thing they jump to is not that I got great results. The first thing they jump yeah. to is like, I feel better when I leave. Yeah. I feel great. It makes me feel good. It makes me feel confident. It makes, it makes me feel comfortable in my skin. It makes me want to show up and work out where I've never mm -hmm. wanted to do that before. And that's why people stay. People don't stay because you get them results because I mean, really everybody can get them some result. We probably get better results. Yeah. Everybody could probably get something. Everybody could probably move the needle. Yeah. Right? It's just, yeah. Okay. yeah. I mean, if we, we can't, dude, if you can't move the needle for a high school athlete, we got a bigger problem. You know, I mean, but, you can pretty uh, much follow either one of our Instagrams and get the free info to get the result anyway. 
exactly literally like you could just copy and paste off my instagram and get something done but i think people stay for the experience yeah we, we have a uh something similar to that in our onboarding process where i generally encourage three pillars of direction and goal orientation i don't believe that we should just have a physique-based goal or a, a performance-based goal because they're they're easy to obtain but the way in which i described is if you obtain your six pack or your stage winning medal at the cost of having to suck dick for money because we ran you broke into the ground and your life collapsed with it. I've failed you as a coach. Our system has failed you because we've emphasized that success and results is only driven by your appearance on a stage, as opposed to the life we construct around it. Often, and I, I guarantee you know, one of the questions I was going to lead to, but I think wrap it up soon is I guarantee with you as well, the way you coach is that there's, there's uh, tra- again, using that word transference of the skills and traits we learn in our sport and our interests that cross over to other areas of life that actually support what you do or facilitate a better person. Like you said, you grow more confident. You stand taller, the shoulders back. You're more confident in your workplace. Therefore, now you're taking on bigger roles. You're taking on bigger roles, you get better, you know, your promotion goes up. Now you're great. you got a better uh, financial portfolio. You're, you're investing in your future. All those things stem back from the fact that we worked on something here that was beyond just your performance on the, on the, on the, the diamond, I guess you guys call it. A pitch, field, <laughs> yes. I don't know. Yeah, we just say field, but yeah, right. diamond the field. <laughs> In the, in, the, in the weird square thing you guys play in, um, you know, or on the bodybuilding stage or in the gym itself or, you know, getting into part of the soccer field, whatever it is, those those traits and skills are transferred to somewhere else. And so to me, the big picture is I always want to have three, three, three goals broken down in ways that aren't exactly heading in the same place, but they're orientated in the same way. So it, it's more like, you know, what's your, what's your uh, performance or physique goal? What is your personal relation goal? And what's your either education, career, or financial goal? So that if there is someone, if I if I see this as a client, and like, you know, I have a decent network now. I spent a long time curating a strong network. If I have someone where like in their future, they're like, you know, I actually want to work on my sprint mechanics. I would love to be able to say, you know, that I can do this. Cool. Hey, Cav, I need to know about sprinting. Can you talk to this guy? Or can you give me some advice here where I can give this guy a better outcome? Yeah, for sure. Cool. Now I can work with that. Or like, you know, I don't know anything about finances, but I know that, you know, we, we work with a mining company now. And we're doing like big things in their in like their wellness program. One of the issues that they have with like that's impacting their performance on site is not health related. It's that a lot of them work in big bucks, but they work because they have to because they're in debt. So for me, solution to that problem is how can I get you guys in touch with an accounting team? Because an accounting team is going to teach you how to financially set yourself up, and you work for fun and pleasure, and you work for the portfolio growth rather than just working for um, you know working for paying back debt and bills. So yeah. I want to know where you would love your finances to go so that I can work on that and go, cool. That's not my job. That's not my forte, but you leave us and you go, fuck, I at least left with knowing that I can save some cash or I can save some money, which is mentally going to make you healthier on site because you're not depressed. Okay. My job's done. Like that to me transcends the idea of just having a six pack because you're trading or like, oh, the wellness program is about being lean. No, it's not. Wellness is about you being well and living a fulfilling life and being healthy on site and off site. So very similar approach is like, I want you to leave matter and, Ironically, people hate when I say this, but like, I want to teach you to not need a coach because then you come back to the coach. It's like, well, this is what he's told me to not need him. Fuck what else is there? So for me, it's yeah. like, I tell my clients from the get-go is my goal is whether you get to stage or whether you're just lifestyle change, whatever it is, I want to teach you to not need me so that you can walk away and sustain what we've done. If I yeah. have the homework, you know, I always make the analogy when Homer used to teach Lisa or work with Lisa at her, at her homework, he would read the homework the night before and then wake up and try and help her with her homework the next day. It looked like he knew what he was doing. The reality is he only learned the day before. So that to yep. me is like, if you're gatekeeping that information, because all you're doing is really just providing them with homework for the next day, that's not coaching. That's not teaching. That's just literally regurgitation. My goal yep. is to teach you in a way where you can step back and go, I'm done. I'm good. I'll come back and I want something new. I've got a new goal. And then they're probably going to feel that, like you said, you know, they're going to have that lockdown moment where they feel there's a void now because they're not with us. And they're either going to tell people to come to us or they're going to come back because that's something cool else they want to do. Like, well, if I hit this goal, what's the next goal? So I, I see a similar tra- a process there for us. It's, uh, you know, not not in the same way, but I think, again, it's indicative of where we see good coaching. Like we see the system for us is not just about, yeah, we got you a pro contract, but your life collapsed around it. That's not that's not anything to me. I failed you as a coach. That to me is yeah. I've let you down. Yeah, 100%. I think one of our big things and one of the things we discuss all the time with athletes is like, no matter what, because athletes, no matter what in in our current system in the U S like they're going to have periods of time where they're away from you, whether it's at the collegiate or the professional level. Right. 
collegiate teams have their own strength and conditioning staffs, which, I mean, that's a whole other discussion. Like we do do some remote with athletes and have them go around those collegiate staffs. Um, that's not, not always, you know, super, um, uh, that's, you know, not always super, <laughs> um, I guess, enjoyable for the collegiate coach mm-hmm. or, um, super kind of uh they're not really excited for that but it does happen <laughs> on the side. but um yeah they, they're gonna go away and then professional same idea i have a lot of professional like i'm doing right now i have 12 remote uh athletes that are all professionals throughout the world i, I was telling you before we got on the call you know i have a professional pitcher in, in australia i've guys literally all over the world um and again like one of the big things is like they're not with me Right. But the ones who have been with me understand the idea of how to advocate for themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's one of our big points. And I think that's something that you're speaking to as well. If you don't necessarily need me all the time, that's great. Mm -hmm. Absolutely excellent. And hopefully I taught you how to appropriately advocate for yourself so that what you are doing from a load management standpoint, from a nutrition, from a sleep standpoint, from a training standpoint, all makes a little bit more sense than it did before you started. And of course, you may want to come back later to ATS. You may want to work with me more in depth later, which is totally fine. But also, if you've left with the ability to appropriately advocate for yourself, so you're not putting yourself in a net negative situation, mm-hmm. I've probably done my job as a coach at some level. I've yep. probably created some level of ownership of process for the o- individual athlete. And I think that is in and of itself the most valuable thing we could probably do for an athlete is create the opportunity for them to advocate for themselves from an educated perspective. Mm -hmm. And then the rest will kind of reverse engineer itself. Probably like you said, back to you. Yeah, I agree. Mate, I've taken up more than enough of your time. um, And we had a little uh, technical hiccup there. So I don't want to run you too late into the evening. Uh, I've got two questions for you. You can rapid fire them. I don't really care. Or give me a depth explanation, but because you guys are Americans and you, uh, your food culture is something that I've never experienced in my entire life until I was there. It's phenomenally disgusting. (laughs) <laughs> what is your i don't know if those two words work it's an oxymoron but it's phenomenal. <laughs> i like it i like it <laughs> what is your go-to cheat meal or what do you what do you give your athletes you got an athlete that's finished a game with yourself and just finished training you're just like boys fight camp's over we're getting a feed in this is what we're doing boys the season's over pitches are done for the year we're getting a fucking feed in what are you going to yeah so we are uh, in philly we have uh this thing we call it a south street cheesesteak and what it is is uh, cheesesteaks it is a cheesesteak so it's a cheesesteak from jim's steaks and then it's a piece of pizza from from uh, lorenzo's pizza you take the pizzas are giant slices you take the slice and you wrap it around the cheesesteak and you eat that um that's top notch it actually in the stadium in um the hell do they call it now wells fargo wells fargo stadium they have both of those places they have a uh, gyms and they have a um angelo's pizza so you can do it there too that's that's pretty up there that's telltale we also have a spot in old city that's a uh, ice cream spot and uh it's all hand spun ice cream it's phenomenal the name is escaping me but we go there a whole bunch after season well, no, we're going when we come to America. yeah yeah those are two we good spots for sure. <laughs> yeah um oh man what is the name of that spot but uh, yeah, so we actually do something called Camp Appy, or we used to, my, my wife and myself, um, we used to have two to three college guys come move into our house and uh, spend their off season with me, the, the intercession. And uh, most of them had to gain weight. So for the vast majority of those guys, they were eating predominantly red meat, white rice, mm-hmm. uh, whole eggs, all those things. And then I would give them one cheat meal a week. And usually what we would do is the cheat meal would be either that or we have in jersey we have a great spot for wings chicken wings so we would do those um one or the other do you guys do do you guys do like the discount wing bucket nights that's big in australia yeah that's a thing here too uh like 50 cent wings or something like that yeah yeah, yeah. it's like yeah. you spend 20 bucks as many wings as you can get down or you spend like 25 cents a wing or some shit in australia which to you guys is like one cent so it's fucking like <laughs> it's just like one of hey, uh, drop drop a hundred piece bucket please and i'll give you a dollar that's cool that we're, we're equal there so that's fucking yeah that's that's a that's a good one uh last question any book of any kind doesn't have to be about training it doesn't have to be about performance it can be psychology but uh, uh philosophy it can be educational one book that you would give someone to read to make them a better person or a better client oh, wow. um yeah so the book i recommend to every coach that is outside of like the coach a little bit outside of the coaching realm is called the body keeps score oh um, yeah 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 
that one for me is something that changed the way that I approach uh, a lot of my conversations in coaching. Um, so that one I love uh, from a coaching perspective, the number one book that we make all of our interns read is triphasic training, and then they read Tudor Bompa's periodization. So I'm sorry, I'm giving you three books now. And from a business perspective, uh, I think one of the most important business books I've ever read is uh, Traction. So for me, and, and we don't utilize necessarily an EOS model, which is like the, the model in, introduced there, but I think the concepts around s systemization and also creating like org charts uh, mm -hmm. are super important. So people can share the responsibility of your business and not just you shoulder the entire burden. I like it, mate. That's it guys. There's too much to recap and too much, uh, you know, technical nuggets in there to recap. You'll certainly really notice that halfway through the show that I changed drink color. So that's, that's literally it. I went, dude, I went two of these and a cup of iced coffee. Yeah. We got after it. <laughs> yeah, we're good. We got into it. Mate, I genuinely appreciate your time and cannot wait to to spend more time with you guys and we get over there. We're gonna have some fucking fun. And I'm keen to come check out the facility and see what's happening over there by the time we get there. So I appreciate your time, brother. I know it's getting late in the evening for you, so I'm gonna let you wrap up and finish for the day. Um, but yeah, dude, look forward to seeing you in the mastermind and the in the group chat talking shit. Awesome. Ben, thank you, brother. I appreciate you so much, man. Let me know if I can help in any way. Appreciate it, bro. Cheers.